Hey, it's Mike here, and today, Ozempic, the popular weight loss drug that's been used by so many celebrities, has been referred to as the celebrity weight loss drug. We're gonna learn a bunch about it, the basics, the risks, and the benefits with a level-headed look, as well as what I have deemed nature's Ozempic, something you can naturally consume, but not the plant-based compound berberin, which some people are claiming is, though it lacks studies. This one actually has randomized controlled trials with comparable weight loss results, possibly better. And then I also wanna to touch on something very rarely covered, and that is resistance to drugs like Ozempic, which could be caused by a particular type of food that actually kills the cells that are activated by Ozempic. Let's just go. All right, we're gonna to get to the basics on this drug and the family of drugs. And it's gonna be a little bit of jargon, but it is quite simple concepts. And these drugs all have an active ingredient called semaglutide, and that is something that boosts the levels of GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide one, which is a hormone and that suppresses appetite. There's a ton of interesting stuff on that we will get to, but I should mention that semaglutide as a drug is really young. It was first approved in 2017 for type two diabetes. Various drugs within that family have then been approved for treating obesity, you know, just for weight loss later on. And there are a few of these like Wegovi, which was taken by Elon Musk. And then Amy Schumer took Ozempic. However, she says that it made her feel so bad that she was unable to play with her kids. So she went off of it, but we're gonna worry about side effects a little bit later. You know, you try it. And I was one of the people that felt like so sick and like couldn't like play with my son. I was so <laughs> skinny and I was just like, like he was throwing a ball at me and I was just, and you're like, okay, this isn't livable for me. But you get the idea that so many celebrities have been taking this. That's why it's the celebrity weight loss drug. <laughs> and here's Jimmy Kimmel joking about it. You look great. Everybody looks so great. When I look around this room, I can't help but wonder, is Ozempic right for me? <laughs> yeah, Ozempic is clearly the most popular one here, and it is an injectable drug. It is injected into, you know, like the thigh or the arm once per week. And the results are, yeah, it definitely works. From this randomized control trial on over a thousand individuals with obesity that lasted about a year and a half. 85% of people lost at least 5% of their body weight, and the average weight loss was about 15% of your body weight. Well, you know, some shorter trials were down at around 10% at six months like this study found, though it is not just fat loss, about a third of that was lean mass, which includes muscle. And from the same study, in terms of calorie intake and appetite, you can see that they ate 25% less calories, which is pretty considerable. And now let's get into how it works, because this is really interesting and can give us more insights into what else also works this way. And that brings us back to that GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide one, which again is a hormone. So normally after you eat this hormone either doubles or even triples, and then it sends your body various signals in your stomach. This means less stomach emptying, less acid secretion, and less movement of food out of the stomach. And the result of that is a decreased appetite and also a lower spike in glucose after meals. It also lowers glucose levels by stimulating the release of insulin in the pancreas. And then finally, for whatever reason, people appear to have less cravings for high fat foods on Ozempic. If you're to take GLP-1, that hormone, and give it to somebody directly intravenously, we see about a 35% decrease in actual food intake. But then going back to the drug itself, that again translates into just about 25% calorie reduction, which is still notable. We're talking about instead of eating a whole eight slice pizza, that's six slices. Instead of eating a dozen donuts, you know, maybe you're down to just eight. All right, now let's get into those side effects slash concerns. But to be completely fair, we can't lose perspective here, I have to quickly remind you really quickly of the impact of obesity from this study in the US. Obesity is responsible for an estimated 300,000 deaths per year. So we can't forget that. Anyway, we have our basic side effects, which were a little bit more common, including nausea, stomach pain, constipation, diarrhea, and vomiting. And then we also have more rare, but you know, more serious side effects, which include pancreatitis, kidney failure, gallstones, and diarrhea diabetic retinopathy, and then there's this concern with thyroid tumors in the animal studies yet to be seen in humans. But what's the only negative effect that people actually care about? Well, that is Ozempic face 
or Ozempic ass, which is essentially some sagging going on there from quick weight loss. And with all the celebrities taking it, that's actually why they call the Screen Actors Guild Awards the SAG Awards. Oh, just kidding. I'm not here to shame loose skin, but come on, I could not leave that joke alone. And it does appear that over time, loose skin can tighten up after weight loss, but some people who want it quickly done do get skin removal surgery. From a plastic surgeon in New York via Insider, quote, the phenomenon with Ozempic is with muscle mass and fat decreasing so quickly, the skin's becoming stretchier than it is purely with the bariatric surgery from what I'm seeing. So it's a little bit more dramatic than than getting stomach surgery. Anecdotally, but we can remember that a third of that weight loss was muscle as well. And this is something that's not Ozempic specific. It's not like a chemical is causing this. It's just because of rapid weight loss. Another concern here is what happens when people go off Ozempic, you know, they're just taking this drug and easily having their appetite suppressed, but then their appetite would come back. Experts seem to agree that there is a concern for weight rebound. In one study, the vast majority of people, 70% stopped this medication over a two year period. And when somebody does stop this medication, they're gonna get weight cycling. In other words, their weight will get back to what it was, maybe even higher. They're gonna get increases in their blood sugar, and they are also gonna get increases in appetite and cravings. For a short term gain, you're not gonna get that long-term benefit and that sustained success that we want for patients that actually do struggle with disease. Anyway, let's move on to another concern, which is cost. It can vary quite a bit, but from WebMD, it can be over $1,000 a month. And as University of Colorado Health mentions, quote, the drugs are expensive and in general, insurance plans don't cover them for weight loss, although they are covered for diabetes. Though the makers of the drug, as drug makers tend to do, are lobbying and they're trying to get Medicare to pay for it, which would cover older adults. And today's video is sponsored by Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, and it is still doggo month at Seed. So, hey, Diego's here. I got another cool dog study for you guys, but first I just have to mention that Seed is a symbiotic, which is a prebiotic plus a probiotic, and this one contains 53.6 billion active cell units of bacteria with 24 different strains, which are scientifically shown to support gut immunity and barrier health, digestive health, heart health, skin health, and more. Now back to our favorite subject, doggos. Yes, last time I mentioned that we have cool studies showing that in young children and old adults, we can see improvements to gut bacteria for those who are exposed to doggies. This time I actually have a study looking at skin biome diversity for people who have pets and are even exposed to wolves. Yes, this 2021 study is titled Wolves, Dogs, and Humans in Regular Contact Can Mutually Impact Each Other's Skin Microbiota. This results in an increase in diversity, but the biggest winner of all is dogs like Diego. Quote, the pet dogs showed the highest level of diversity. Sorry, wolves. I knew I was superior to those wolves. And Lindy and I have been getting the benefits of seed since 2021 when we started taking it. And Lindy is so into it that she's going to bring some seed to her sister we're about to see on vacation. <laughs> no, to make her try it. Anyway, if you would like to try seeds, DS01 Daily Symbiotic, click the link below and use Mike, M-I-C at checkout for 25% off your first month's supply. All right, now let's get onto this topic of nature's Ozempic because the moment I learned about GLP-1, I had to just sweep the literature for natural things that do boost GLP-1 and have that same appetite suppressing effect that you maybe don't need to inject for $1,000 a month. Now, because this is an appetite related hormone, you can guess that there are foods that boost it. Foods like glucose, certain fats, as well as certain proteins like arginine. However, if that was enough for people to just lose weight, the standard American diet loaded with you know sugar and fat and various proteins would make it so nobody was overweight. No, it doesn't help if a GLP-1 trigger is either super high calorie itself or is bringing its high calorie friends along for the ride, not gonna help. Well, what GLP-1 booster is essentially missing from the US diet, you know, what are 97% of people in the US deficient of? That brings us to the first part. There's multiple parts of nature's Ozempic and that is, you know, it's not that exciting, okay, fiber. I swear this is actually interesting. How does fiber do it? Well, with a little help 
from our friends down there, our gut bacteria, because they break certain fibers down into short chain fatty acids, which I've talked about quite a bit. And from this study, short chain fatty acids can stimulate the secretion of GLP-1, which indirectly regulates blood glucose levels on and on. And also from this study, three days of barley fiber increased fermentation activity and serum levels of short chain fatty acids in healthy adults, resulting in increased levels of gut hormones like GLP-1, as well as improved insulin sensitivity. Finally, from this paper, adding some extra fiber has been shown to reduce body fat, increase levels of various things like GLP-1 and boost those gut microbes. But is anybody saying that making a dietary change like this would actually have an impact? Yeah, from this one quote. The stimulation of endogenous GLP-1 secretion by manipulating the composition of the diet may be a relevant strategy for obesity and type 2 diabetes management, just like Ozempic. And before we move on past fiber, I just have to mention a couple more mechanisms because it's not just all about GLP-1, but from this paper, some of these short chain fatty acids might cross the blood brain barrier and regulate satiety through the central nervous system. And credit Credit to Cyrus Kambata of Mastering Diabetes for getting me thinking about this topic and also mentioning just that fiber has bulk. Now bulk equals fiber plus water. When you eat bulk, it mechanically stretches your small and large intestines, which then sends the same electrical signal to your brain to reduce your appetite. And that brings us back to the classic comparison of 400 calories of oil or meat or vegetables. And you can just see that one's gonna fill you up with less calories dramatically more. Now for the second punch of the one-two punch of the nature's ozempic that I believe is most valid. And that brings us back to glucose because glucose appears to be, as this study mentions, a potent stimulator of GLP-1. And the only other thing I've heard called that is ozempic. And from this one, among macronutrients, glucose is the best known molecule responsible for stimulating GLP-1 secretion. But obviously refined glucose is horribly unhealthy for you. So let's look for a solution. A hint is that GLP-1 producing enteroendocrine cells are scattered throughout the epithelium or just the lining of the small and large intestines. So we essentially have these GLP-1 switches all the way across our intestines. So what's the best way to get a GLP-1 booster like glucose to evenly be distributed across 22 feet of small intestines and another six feet of large intestine? Well, the answer is, take a guess. I'll give you two seconds. One, two, did you guess? whatever, <laughs> whole starches are of course chains of glucose that along with fiber have a delayed digestion, which means they're going to be dropping glucose down your whole intestinal system. And so that glucose and of course the fiber itself are also boosting GLP-1. So yeah, I'm calling whole starches nature's ozempic. Now we're talking whole grains, roots, tubers, legumes. These are whole starches that are associated with lower obesity and lower mortality. But can the weight loss of whole starches really stand up to a popular drug like Ozempic? Yes, from this randomized control trial known as the Broad Study out of New Zealand, took people with obesity and told them you can eat as much as you want as long as it is a whole starch plant-based diet and you don't even have to add exercise. And of trials where people could eat as much as they want and didn't add exercise, they found the greatest weight loss at six and 12 months that they had ever seen. Yeah, at that six month mark, they had lost an average of 13% of their body weight. Well, this study on Ozempic at six months out had lost 11% of their body weight. So we can say very comparable, but actually slightly more. And I actually made a comparison list of Ozempic versus Nature's Ozempic, AKA whole starches. And here we are. Firstly, studies show comparable weight loss. Again, 13 versus 11. Starches have a lower cost because they're generally cheap and you need to eat anyway. And you can still be hungry and eat till you're full without having all that nausea. And you also get a lot of antioxidants from various legumes and such. And you get those other benefits of fiber and short chain fatty acids. You get gut biome benefits. 
And with a plant-based diet, we see about 15% lower cancer risk, yet we have a potential thyroid cancer risk from those animal studies. Next, it doesn't have to be injected. The injection is actually food directly into the mouth. Next, fiber normalizes bowel movements. You don't have that constipation slash diarrhea boomerang situation. You don't have yet to be discovered long-term risks from a drug from 2017. And unlike ozempic face, fiber face is not a thing just makes you look better. And here's an important point people might be thinking, well, I will just eat some more whole starches and keep slamming down a bunch of high saturated fat animal products. Well, it looks like in no situation you're gonna be able to do that and lose weight, whether you're on Ozempic or not. And that brings us to GLP-1 or even GLP-1 drug resistance. From this paper, quote, some patients have to discontinue treatment because of the lack of efficacy, which defines a state of GLP-1 resistance. And the most likely culprit here seems to be high saturated fat diets, likely through two mechanisms. The first of which I have not heard anybody talk about. I was just going through the research and I found this 2016 study. They found that long-term consumption of certain types of saturated fat, which are mostly gotten from dairy, like ice cream and butter, as well as meat, but also palm oil, actually cause cell death or kill your GLP-1 producing cells. However, oleate, a fat that is found in olives, has the opposite effect, helps them survive longer. Now I will say this is just a Petri dish study, which is why I wanna move on to more research, which has to do with the gut biome. In a recent study, gut microbiota dysbiosis caused GLP-1 resistance in two types of high fat diet fed mice with impaired glucose tolerance. And that high fat diet fed mice were resistant not only to GLP-1 induced insulin secretion and stomach emptying inhibition, but also to its suppression of food intake. Well, we need more studies in humans. This 2022 human trial does corroborate that people with gut dysbiosis appear to have a lack of response to the drug, which also implies resistance to their own GLP-1. And high animal fat diets induce gut dysbiosis in like 24 hours, as studies like this one found. So an obvious strategy is to eat a whole food plant-based diet to patch up that gut dysbiosis, as well as take things like seed, and then also the whole starches of the diet will increase that GLP-1. And now for the last segment here, I wanna go out on a limb and speculate a little bit, and that has to do with the addiction-related promise of Ozempic. We've seen in the news that it could help with addiction. And so could fiber also have a role here? Looking at this Discovery Magazine article, to sum it up, there has been a lot, albeit ethically concerning, animal research on this. Now, cocaine bear, how about cocaine rats? And, you know, also drunken monkeys. The results, GLP-1 boosters appear to curb addictive behaviors and addiction to these substances in animals. So with the effects of whole starches and fiber on GLP-1, could this be why there are so many straight edge vegans that stay away from drugs and alcohol? They're just not addicted. I'm kidding, obviously vegans can get addicted to all that stuff too. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Couldn't really find a clear answer in the research on this. The closest I could get was this 2021 study on fiber intake and alcohol use disorder. As you might've guessed, people with this disorder tend to not eat as much fiber generally. Here is a interesting chart of various types of fiber consumption for healthy subjects versus alcohol use disorder in red. Yeah, they're eating like half as much fiber. So the question is, could the lower fiber consumption be leading to lower GLP-1 and less addiction, addictive behavior resistance? Or is it reverse causation? Just people who are drinking a lot of alcohol and stuff are probably not eating any fiber anyway. To be determined, and I wanna throw in one last fun GLP-1 fact, apparently chewing longer also increases GLP-1 a bit. Fun to know, chew your food. In the end, I wanna have a level-headed, multifaceted conclusion here because on one hand, I do believe that the best results for overall health and well-being would be something like a whole starch plant-based diet, which has a bunch of other benefits, including those antioxidants and phytochemicals and gut benefits. But then I see a large portion of the population who is simply not even aware that that's an option or for whatever other reason would refuse to do that. 
Ozempic would help them, you know, people with dietary addictions. And we have to remember that if you were to throw obesity in as a leading cause of death, although it's sort of contributing to other main leading causes of death, you know, it's up there at 300,000 deaths. I believe heart disease is 600,000. And from a vegan activist roundabout perspective, 25% less food means 25% less animals killed and maybe animal suffering, maybe even less with less high fat diet cravings. My next video title, should vegan activists promote Ozempic to save animals? And finally, I really would love to see more research on that connection between saturated fat in high amounts and damage to this GLP-1 system, which is similar. It's through ceramides, as I've talked about in the past, which is what causes insulin resistance from saturated fat. So that definitely needs to be researched more. But again, 13% body weight reduction at six months on whole starch plant-based diet or 11% on Ozempic at six months. I mean, this is nature's Ozempic, but really just natural foods that actually trigger your appetite, but we'll make it fancy sounding anyway. And finally, of course, if you would like to try Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, click the link below for 25% off your first month's supply. Thank you to Seed, thank you for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.